and don't have any friends who are Ukrainians. I nevertheless feel very intensely what's going on. So you might wonder why I could call this good news. And it refers to an encounter that Gandhi had with someone, Mahatma Gandhi, the great Indian leader, who, uh, who was in, encountered by someone who said, Mr. Gandhi, you are always talking about nonviolence, nonviolence. Is it ever okay to fight back when someone's trying to hurt you? Is it ever okay to fight back violently? And Gandhi said, yes, if that's all the person can think of to do. However, I believe there's always a nonviolent path that can be pursued. And even in the midst of these weeks of amazing amounts of media coverage of the suffering and the horror of what's going on over there, and there, there's also been heroic standing up in Russia itself, in 100 cities, and also tremendous standing up in Ukraine, resisting oppression, resisting injustice. And so from a Ghanaian point of view, it's good news. And one of the things I want to honor about uh, the, the possibilities that we all have, when we see something terrible happening and there's so little we can do, we're so far from the conflict. Of course, I send money to uh, doctors beyond borders for medical assistance and so on, but feeling the powerlessness that comes from a great distance geographically. But one thing that I, I've learned to be able to do when things happen far away from me is to try to earn, uh, is, is try to honor, to try to honor those people who are going through that hard time and to try to learn from their experience. I know we often learn most vividly from our own painful experiences, but it's possible, thank God, because of the gift of empathy, it's possible to learn from the experience of others. And that's what we need to do. That's at least what I need to do and what I'm willing to share. One of the things that I learned from this conflict is that there's a tremendous need for innovation in how human beings wage struggle. And when I think about innovation, I naturally, being a Quaker, go immediately to that place and ask myself, well, what are some of the forces that have been involved with Quakers innovating? Because we do have a history of invasion. And I've realized that one of the impulses that drives us to, in, to, to innovate is the, uh, the pressure of an ethic, of a moral stand, what we call a testimony about how things ought to be, even if there's no apparent way to do that thing. But the number of innovations that come from that ethical impulse are impressive. I think, for example, of those uh, 17th century Quaker shopkeepers who, who, who came to the belief that ethically it wasn't right to spend the day haggling over the price of the goods that they were selling. Because it seemed to those folks that there was a fair price for a particular product that someone wanted to buy that would take into account what it cost to make and also what it cost him usually to sell. And he ought to just put a price on that thing so people could come in look at the price and decide whether they can buy it or not. Well, as in many innovative <laughs> tools that we invent, uh, which are really against the mainstream, against conventional thinking, uh, the first shopkeepers who did that did that must have wondered, you know, am I going to be immediately out of business because everyone's haggling everywhere? And of course, what they found was that people shopped at Quaker shopkeepers in droves because this was a wonderful breakthrough. 
and opened up a lot of time in the day when you didn't have to spend time haggling. I think of another area of profound innovation by Quakers. Imagine coming to the American frontier from England without a gun. I try to imagine some farmer in Northwest England uh, telling, the, telling his neighbor that uh, the family was going to move to Pennsylvania. And the, the neighbor saying, well, I know you Quakers don't hold with guns, but you'll certainly take one for that, right? And I can imagine the farmer saying, no, no, we're not going to do that. And them getting into quite an argument with the, uh, with the neighbor attacking the farmer with irresponsibility and uncaring toward his children and so on, because he was exposing his family to such enormous danger on the American frontier. And uh, as historians have discovered, Quakers were the safest people on the American frontier. Over and over, what we have found is that when we're driven to innovation by our ethical stands, some good things can come of it. Some breakthroughs in human behavior can come from it. And that's what awakens me in this very, very hard thing to, to watch that's going on in the Ukraine. How is it that innovation can happen so that when one nation invades and tries to dominate another, that there can be a resistance. Gandhi said, resist no matter what, resist, um, but nevertheless resist nonviolently. Now, fortunately, because I'm historically oriented, I just love history, I look in history to see whether there have been innovators, whether they've been Quakers or not, uh, who've, who've made any kind of breakthrough on this. And I, my ver very first thought when I started this line of reasoning was Czechoslovakia in 1968, because it was invaded by the Russians, by the Soviet Union, um, and actually got its allies in the Warsaw Pact to participate as well. So there were troops coming into Czechoslovakia in 1968 in August uh, from, uh, from the Soviet Union, but also from uh, Budapest, from, from, uh, from a neighboring uh, Warsaw Pact. Pack countries. And what was striking about that was that the, the head of Czechoslovakia, it was a dictatorship, uh, but the reason why, for the invasion was that the dictatorship was becoming remarkably open. There'd been a Prague Spring, there'd been a tremendous ferment, and, and some of the old dictatorial ways were, were weakening, and that, that, that struck uh, Mo uh, Moscow as outrageous, and they wanted to put a stop to that. And Dubček, the leader of Czechoslovakia, refused to put a stop to it. And so they thought, well, then we're just going to have to dominate the country again and set things right. And so uh, there they were pouring across the border. Well, Dubček knew in the hours just before that, that uh, he was likely to be arrested, taken to Moscow and shot, uh, but at least he could minimize the damage. And so he locked the troops, the military troops in the barracks to make sure there would not be a military conflict or at least to make that less likely. And then the next day, was he ever surprised when people resisted the incoming invasion in profoundly innovative ways. There were people who would stand at a bridge and refuse to move, unarmed people, and refuse to move until the tank itself <laughs> turned around and tried to find some other way. Uh, there was a, a, a tactic, which also was picked up here in Ukraine the last couple of weeks, of, uh, of turning, the, uh, turning the directional signs around so that the invading troops couldn't find out where they were and which way to go. Uh, there, there were many, many tactics that the uh, Czechs and Slovaks came up with that were intensely interactive, that really, um, really put them nose to nose with the invading troops. Now, the reason why that was so important is because the, the Soviet soldiers were, of course, conscripts and doing this. And, uh, and, and, and the, here they were meeting you know, people like themselves who didn't want to be 
dominated and intense, intense com, uh, confrontations happen. And sometimes so intense and some, somewhat more amusing. For example, it, it, in, in one case that I read of when I was doing the research, um, I found that uh, actually in more than one case, there, there were young lovers who decided to make out in front of the invading troops and say to the troops, hey, I and you like to be home doing this instead of being here. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, upping the ante with regard to interaction, such as to make it harder for the troops to be maintaining their morale. What happened was the troops started out within three days, like butter in the sun. And, and on the third day, the, the Soviets actually started to rotate their troops back to the Soviet Union because they couldn't be counted upon to, uh, to inflict the damage that the uh, Soviets were, were planning to inflict. So that was a remarkable, remarkable demonstration of people spontaneous uh, standing up for themselves. What happened was that instead of Dubček, uh, the leader, being shot in Moscow, as he expected, uh, he was sat down and negotiated with, and an accommodation was reached such that the Czechoslovak people were not dominated by the Soviet Union, but, uh, but the, the, their existing government but with rules that were less liberal. And it took them some years before another opening happened. And then Czechoslovak rose up nonviolently and were able to change their, demo their form into democrat uh, democratic practice. Uh, so one example that's very heartening to me. Another example that came to me uh, very quickly was that in the Ruhr Valley in 1923 in Germany, Germany having been just uh, uh, just defeated in World War I, uh, into the Ruhr Valley troops from Belgium and France uh, who had won the war and were upset because the snow and uh, coal region of Germany was not producing uh, goods fast to get the reparations going to Belgium and, uh, and France at the level to, for, to which they'd been uh, promised. And so they invaded in order to force this to happen. And of, of course, there was no chance of military resistance in that case because Germany had just been defeated in the war. And so the government said, how about you folks in the Ruhr go on strike, which is a nonviolent tool. And that's exactly what happened. Mass non-cooperation. The miners refused to mine coal. They said, well, you've got bayonets. See how far you get mining coal. Um, and this became a stalemated uh, a struggle in which the Belgians and the French did not get what they want. And finally, an international face-saving commission led by an American was set up in order to work out a, a, an arrangement by which Belgium and France could withdraw without having forced the Germans to do what the Germans said that they did not do. So here were some innovations. Uh, Quakers can't take credit for those. <laughs> they were innovations in of conflict. And one of the things that impresses me about both of them is that they happened without training of the people, nor a clear strategy that could be imparted to the people. So it was very, very spontaneous what happened. Now, if you asked a military commander, how would you like to go into uh, some kind of uh, major struggle uh, without a strategy and with soldiers who weren't trained? <laughs> they would laugh at you because of course, training and strategy are essential for effective and efficient combat. But in, and that is actually equally true. Uh, it's not as true in nonviolent struggle, but it makes a difference. If, for example, the, uh, the young people from the North in the United States who went to Mississippi to face the Ku Klux Klan in 1964, Freedom Summer, I was one of the trainers to, for the training, um, the, the, the training for the thousand young people who went south. Um, of course, they the, the civil rights understood movement understood that the the, uh, the these young people couldn't be counted on to be the nonviolent soldiers that they wanted them to be if they didn't have training first. Training is is a, a very very important part of increasing the effect of nonviolence, just as it is 
for increasing the effectiveness of violence. And the cases, I could go into more cases if you like, um, are, are, are striking how spontaneous they were without training and without the leader that could offer a, a clear strategy. Now, I, I'll, I'll point to two more examples of, of his historical comparison. There's, there's sad news uh, as, re, as a result of this comparison. This is a comparison between Norway and Denmark's um, experience in meeting German invasion during World War II. Nazi Germany wanted both Denmark and Norway to their heel, move troops into both of them. Very different responses. In Denmark, the government's decision was much like that of Czechoslovakia's uh, leader Dubček, which was lock the troops in the barracks. Do, do not resist militarily. Obviously, we're going to be overwhelmed, um, just as as those other cases I mentioned, obviously militarily we will be overwhelmed, right? So we're not going to play that game uh, and we'll see what develops. Well, what developed, again, without strategy, without training, was such effective nonviolent resistance on the part of the Danes. They were able to foil some of the biggest objectives that the German occupation had. One was to get warships, for fighting the war, especially the, 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 the front with Britain needed more ships and the Danish workers, the best shipbuilders in the world, arguably, suddenly became totally klutzy and couldn't manage to put a, a ship together. Some of the half-built ships were towed to Hamburg and Germany to be finished because the Germans couldn't get these workers to do the, uh, and, 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 uh, and of course a very important, uh, very, very important objective from Hitler's point of view was to round up the, the Jews of, of, uh, of, of Denmark and take them to concentration camps. And the, uh, again, outwitted by the nonviolent resistance, which thanks to a leak, by the way, I was talking about trying to get the occupying forces to move, right? There's a leak from the, the, the occupiers to the Danes saying, this is the day we're supposed to round up all the Jews. It was in time. Instead, the Jews were put on fishing ships, fishing uh, uh, Danish fish, fishing boats in Sweden safety and almost all the Danish Jews were saved. So that, that is one case, but against the same opponent, now we're talking Germany, you have the, Dan the Norwegian decision to resist militarily and they did. The militarily in the south, Norway is a very, very long country, you know, uh, they resisted retreating, 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 retreating up to the um, beyond the Arctic Circle and and incredible uh, wreckage and considerable bloodshed happened as a result of that struggle. Were they overwhelmed? Of course they were overwhelmed. And so, what a contrast between Denmark and Norway in terms of lives lost, people suffering, refugee production, and the and the uh, destruction of the economic infrastructure. By the time I got to Norway as a student in 1959, 14 years after the war was over, I found that in Norway we're still rationing. Whereas rationing in the U.S., you know, ended very soon after World War II, the, the rationing was continuing in some respects in Norway still four years later. That's how badly the economy was hammered. Well, comparing, comparing. And again, the brilliant Danish resistance, there was also brilliant Norwegian resistance. The occupation was set. Then people started spontaneously not only innovating and doing some beautiful, beautiful work, uh, and, and re retaining the integrity of the schools, retaining the integrity of the churches, which were, uh, you know, the, the Nazis wanted to take over. So there was a lot, there was a lot of excellent Norwegian uh, uh, nonviolent resistance, but it took, um, it took place 
in the context of already having lost military struggle in which a lot of people had their hearts. And so all that problem about you shift gears when you come into a defeat as compared with the, the Danish resistance. Okay, so uh, what's the big picture of comparing these two and uh, the, the days of resisting? Gandhi said, yes, if you don't know any better, if you can't think of anything else to do, resist violently, but resist non-violently if you're willing to be an innovator, figure it out, try something. And the statistics uh, show is that uh, the, the, the um, I'll refer to the book because some of you know this book already. Uh, it's, a, it's political scientists who did a workup of all the cases of national level struggle from 1900 to 2006. And they uh, looked then at each case, determined whether it could be called nonviolent or whether it could be called violent, and then compared their success ratio. What they found with regard to occupations was that most occupiers were able to maintain their domination despite resistance. But in 35% of the cases of resistance against fire, the people on the ground uh, were able to win. So odds weren't great. One third possibility, but one third success. But they also compared what about those who resisted nonviolently and what are those who resisted violently? That, that's like the Danish Norwegian comparison. Right? What they found was pretty much the same success rate. In other words, and this is mind blowing in American content culture where we all know that violence is the way to go. Violence is more powerful than nonviolence, right? Many of us have been taught that since we were little. Well, turns out just not to be true. Uh, they have the same success rate. Uh, actually, nonviolence has a slightly better success rate, uh, but you know, given statistics, I wouldn't want to claim too much. I would just say, a, a, a slightly better chance of success for those movements that resisted occupation nonviolently. That's what's more, just as interesting to me, which is that um, the non, those who chose to resist occupation nonviolently won more quickly than those who resisted violently. That's an important matter. How long do you want to be in struggle? It's exhausting. And there are cases. So quicker success by choosing nonviolence. Furthermore, the, the, the cases in which people were nonviolently resisting were able to establish democratic governance more quickly than those who resisted violently. In fact, many of those who resisted violently, the invasion by an adjoining nation, uh, found that they never were able to achieve democratic governance, even though they tried. So now, this is like the shopkeeper, right? Shopkeepers try something, it's my, I might do this when I try, and oh my gosh, it's, it works. This might be like the Quakers on the American frontier. Whoa, we're safer than, you know, the Baptist down the street who's got a gun. Uh, their surprises, and that's good news, their surprises involved, in, embedded in the peace testimony. If we are courageous enough to fully embody the peace testimony, it means nonviolently struggling for goals that are important to struggle for. And if we further make it likely we will succeed, by being trained to do so and developing strategic plans for doing so, then we can expect frequent breakthroughs even in a country like this, the, Amer uh, the America that I know now, which is arming up like crazy, which has militias 
organizing and growing. And it's very easy to predict lots of violence in the future, right? So this is, this is another element of what I think can claim good news. Now, finally, on a Ukraine point of view, uh, with regard to the Ukraine situation, um, a, a surprise to me was learning and researching for this, that there was a public opinion survey done in 2015 by a sociology institute in Ukraine, which was curious uh, about what the people might, th there were already indications from Russia, of course, that an invasion might be in the offing. Uh, so they were curious about what, what were the inclusions given that kind of scenario. Uh, 2015 was after Donbass had been pretty much invaded after the seizure of Crimea, right? So the, the, uh, the, the researchers who did this study pretty much expected most everybody would line up, well, we have to do uh, defense. And why not? Because in almost all countries, that's what conventional wisdom says is the right thing. Yeah. Okay. Turns out they gave options. They gave options in the survey. So they gave one option. You could, you, uh, what do you think of civil resistance, which is a kind of code for nonviolent resistance uh, as compared with violent resistance. More Ukrainians in that survey Pre said they preferred to do nonviolent resistance or civil resistance, as they called it, than preferred to do violent resistance. So that's something to think about as well. Yes, there's a history. There's a history. 2004, Ukrainians overthrew a dictatorship <laughs> nonviolently. Right? So they had about muscles there and uh, very pleased with themselves. And then in 2014, when their, their uh, governmental leader was moving toward dictatorship, they threw him out as well, nonviolently, with some exceptions, but l largely nonviolently. So in other words, the Ukrainian people themselves had been doing in it. They had been discovering the power of nonviolence themselves. And that accounts for that, uh, that, that, that slight preference for nonviolent resisting an invasion should it occur as already in 2015 it was looking, looking dicey. Okay, I'd like to finally just mention some resources because some of the things that I've referred to uh, are probably um, of interest to you for following up. So, the, the cases that I referred to in Ukraine and Denmark and Norway can be found here on the Global Knowledge Database. It's an online database that you can just uh, search and find very, and it's been put online by Swarthmore. While I was teaching at Swarthmore, we put over a thousand cases of nonviolent struggle in history on the database. So you might enjoy that. And uh, as, I, as I say, you can look into those particular, uh, particular uh, cases that way. And then the other thing I'd like to point out is that waging nonviolence continues to be, and has been now for years, a solid place to turn to an online publication for articles uh, by me and colleagues of mine and people I don't even know, but are wonderful writers and researchers who are constantly keeping abreast of what are the uh, very often remarkable, very often remarkable uh, achievements of the innovators. And if we need innovation in conflict, let's coach ourselves. Let's turn to the resources and let's turn other people onto the resources as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. Um, as people have already started doing, uh, if you have a question to ask George in this next little question and answer period, please type it into the chat. And then Mary and I will take turns in uh, choosing a question and reading it aloud for George to answer. Um, I see- Curtis? Yeah. Uh, 
I, I just want to interject. There were a number of questions about a recording. So I hope folks notice that this is being recorded. Santa Monica meeting and George will both be making the recording available. Uh, you can find Santa Monica meeting online. George, you might um, let folks know how they would find the recording uh, from you. And sure. I will post the um, chat notes on the Western Friend website and get those to um, Curtis and George also. So there's a lot of notes in the chat that will be, um, you know, that folks will might want to have access to. I just want to confess that we were a little um, nervous about opening the chat up to everyone, given how some of the Zoom events concerning Ukraine have happened. So we wanted to keep a little bit of more control over this meeting than, than uh, we might otherwise. So that, I'm done. OK. I'm choosing one. Uh... Question. Yeah, George is putting his email address in uh, it up there. And perhaps we'll put that in the chat. I'll, as I'll well. put that in the chat. Thank you. Uh, George, one question I'm seeing is uh, um, it reads uh, I have seen, let me find it here again. Okay. I have seen music being played in the streets and people, in, and people standing in front of tanks. Are there other examples of nonviolent resistance uh, in Ukraine today that you are aware of? My favorite example is an old woman coming up to these uh, soldiers with packets of sunflower seeds and saying, hey, please, dear, uh, put, th put this in your pocket so that if you don't make it out of here, there'll be sunflowers that will bloom wherever it is that you fall. <laughs> And uh, so, some somebody showed me the video. That how to, I don't know how to get the video, but uh, but you see the soldiers being so uncomfortable and really wanting her to be gone, you know, because it's so so uncomfortable. But she's this old lady. You, what are you going to do? You, know, you don't feel threatened by her. And there she is <laughs> saying, <laughs> "You might, but at least uh, you know, you'll be redeemed by the sunflowers jacket." <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, there's another example um, uh, th that uh, some of you will remember the tank man of Tenement Square uh, who stood in front of a row of tanks. Uh, something like that happened. So that was caught uh, by I forget which media uh, agency um, showing that the, a young man um, uh, uh, with his uh, hands up, cl clearly not violent, right? Clearly not threatening anybody and standing right in front of the tank and then pushing with his chest, like, you know, and, and, the, and the tank driver backing up slightly <laughs> as he's pushing the tank. Uh, another example that I think uh, I've been reading with is, um, is uh, several people together standing unarmed uh, and again with hands up to show, um, in front of the truck truck convoy of a Russian convoy in such a way that in, in, on a narrow road, in such a way that the trucks, in order to get by him uh, and them, had to sort of go way over into the shoulder in somewhat precarious uh, grounding, uh, you know, to, to get by, because that's how much the driver didn't want to drive over uh, these nonviolent uh, Ukrainians who they didn't know at all. The power of nonviolence is really quite extraordinary, but it, it takes some experimentation, right? In order for you, I've been pulled, knives have been pulled on me three times in my life. Um, and, uh, and I've been surrounded by a hostile gang late at night, that kind of thing. And I just figure, well, Try this, try that. <laughs> and if I've heard a story about somebody who's been, you know, in a hostile encounter, maybe a life-threatening encounter, uh, I'll, I'll try it. And the story worked for them, I'll try it out for me. So having that experimental approach, I think makes so much sense in an area where so many people are stuck. So many people are stuck with this uh, ideology that prizes violence.
Mary, do you want to choose a question? Um, there are a number of questions in the chat concerning what, if you know of any organizing that's going on in Ukraine, organizing, and that uh, there was a mention of a, a peace institute in Ukraine uh, that might have been attacked. Do you, is that anything you know about? I'm afraid I don't. I don't. Oh, there's tons of organizing in the sense of, uh, you know, organizing survival. But I think as far as organizing a resistance, um, people are primarily involved with just survival needs right now, assisting refugees and so on. It's over 3 million now who've left. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, there were also that's another advantage, you know, from a strategic point of view, what you want in a country occupied, in, if you were a, a you know a nonviolent general, <laughs> what you would want is massive amounts of human capital to throw against your enemy, right? So those are three million people already out of the population of forty million who have exited the country. Uh, if you were if you were a Gandhi, you would say, no, you don't exit. Stay here, and we'll fight together, and we'll be nonviolent, and we'll win. But the um, yeah, yeah, the, the, but but at this point, uh, it, it's a matter of uh, survival because the choice to resist militarily uh, means then everything's about survival, and that makes it very very hard to organize an effective resistance. Maybe there's something I don't know. There are also a number of questions about organizing here for the current situation. Mm. And, and I will also note that there's lots of specific questions in the chat that you will be interested to respond to uh, individually later. Okay. But, but organizing in the US concerning the current situation? Well, if you have influence on the um, our elite, <laughs> Please use it for not increasing the amount of firepower available in that situation. Uh, the, the more weapons there are there, the more will be discharged, right? And the more people who will be killed. Uh, it's a kind of killing fest that's going on. Uh, and uh, Biden is uh, yielding to pressure and sending more and more weapons there. Of course, the military industrial complex would be delighted because those are weapons that need to be replaced by US tax dollars. Amen. But I hope that uh, we, uh, if you have any influence, it's, it's very hard to start now a movement that, you know, a mass movement that could be effective because this is being made by a very small group of people very distant uh, sociologically. But anyway, if you do happen to be part of that magic circle, uh, sure, use your influence by reducing the amount of harm that we're exporting, the means of harm. George, you mentioned before uh, the example of the tank man in, of Tiananmen Square. And that I think for many people, many of us speaking, uh, uh, is when we think of a failed incidence of nonviolent resistance, that is a very powerful one that comes to, to mind. But I think, would you address, like if someone, if someone immediately goes there and they're thinking, this is what nonviolent resistance is, it's futile, it'll get you killed. What would you, what, what's your brief response to that? Right, well, the, uh... The statistics are really compelling about that. Two thirds of the cases of resistance by violence failed, and two thirds of them that resisted nonviolently failed. Rough. So uh, it's very often the people who challenge, and I've been challenged now for uh, sixty years <laughs> about nonviolence. Boom. The unstated assumption is violence is more powerful. So they're saying, you know, in Tiananmen Square, 
that was a glorious nonviolent resistance and it failed, right? Oh, so, therefore, what? That a violent resistance would have? See, that's the unstated assumption because there, there is this belief uh, goes even beyond earlier than John Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> that the thing to do to be powerful is to be violent. And that's just not true. It's just not true. And that's why this book is so important. These, uh, uh, just a brief story will help you on this. These two people, Erica Chenoweth and, and Maria Stefan, Stefan, who I know, are political scientists in the sub field of political science called security studies, which tends to attract the most hard nosed of the political scientists. And I'm, you know, I'm soft nosed, I'm sociologist, but th these are the hard nosed people, right? And they love statistics. And however, M Maria happened to believe that, um, that uh, nonviolent resistance could often have big payoff. And she was in an argument with Erica about that. And she said, okay, I wanna challenge you. Why don't we do a statistical study and find out what's really so? You're assuming the violence is more powerful, but let's find out. I'm willing to submit to the evidence if you are. Well, okay, because I'm sure I'm right, thinks Erica, right? So they go to work and they look at all the cases from 1900 to 2000, which is 323 cases. And they look at every single one and they rate them by degree of success or degree of failure. And what they find overall, now I was doing a subcategory of, of the occupations, the overall picture from that 323 case uh, uh, the statistical array is that you doubled chances of success if you chose nonviolence as means doubled your chance of success if you chose non-violence. Now that to many people that I know sounds like craziness. Well, guess what? It's hard-boiled political science. And it, it rocked the field of political science, of, of political science itself. Rocked because the statistics were all in here, carefully revealed as scholars very often do. And so they can run the statistical array themselves and see if they come up with a different, uh, a different, a different thing. And nobody has come up with a different look at the 323 cases and come to some different conclusion. In other words, this is solid, but just like the people who don't believe in the vaccination, <laughs> We have, as, as uh, in general, a culture that doesn't believe in uh, nonviolence, and therefore, each uh, movement. I mean, think how hard Dr. King had to work on that. Each movement has to rediscover the superior power of nonviolence, and when it push comes to shove, when there are actual comparisons that can be made, taking everything in account, it's quite clear that nonviolent power is greater than violent power. But the assumption that lurks behind every challenge of, well, this nonviolent movement didn't work is that violence would have, no, violence most likely would have been even a bigger failure because but George, the correct- But George. Do, yes, yes. I, I, but <laughs> Go. Yay. Go for it. <laughs> She's muted. Um, there's a couple questions in the chat here about positive actions that we ought to be pressuring the power elite to take. Uh, are there um, ideas that you have and uh, there was a, a question about how to make peacemaking profitable. Mm. Yes, I, I wrote a book about that um, called Strategy for a Living Revolution. And that proposes that we tilt the structure of what works in such a way that peacemaking will visibly pay off. Now that, however, 
assumes that for a living revolution assumes that uh, we will have have to displace the economic elite of the United States in order to create that society. And that's because the economic elite of the United States is deeply, deeply invested in the profits that come from the military industrial complex. Deep, deeply invested in those, both directly in terms of just the swollen size of it, but also in terms of the maintenance of the American empire from which other sources of money come. We've got an economic elite that is very clear that violence is the way to go. And, and so it's not possible to, uh, for our country to take a different posture as long as the economic elite happens to be in charge. Now, is the economic elite in charge? Or maybe we're a democracy, who knows? Well, some people, some researchers have looked at that as well. And uh, the Princeton study is really worth looking at. Uh, uh, you can go online and find the Princeton oligarchy study <laughs> because the, the, the BBC account of the study, they called it uh, uh, the oligarchy study. And so it got to be called that. The authors themselves, these Princeton scholars, didn't call it oligarchy. But what they did say was that they, they did a statistical array, they're political scientists, they love statistical arrays. So they did a statistical, a couple of decades of national decisions, policy decisions that were made in the United States. And they, they compared for each of these decisions, what was the opinion of the economic elite on this decision before it was made? And what was the opinion of the majority of American people? Now, of course, in some cases, the economic elite happened to agree with the majority of American people. So cool. But what about if the economic elite disagreed with the majority opinion? Which side won? What the Princeton study shows is that in the overwhelming number of cases in which there was a disagreement, it was the economic elite's view that carried the day. The government went ahead and implemented so the conclusion of the study, just go on and find this. The conclusion of the study, obviously in reluctance, <laughs> is that if you call democracy majority rule, that's not what we've got. Okay, well, they're being, being faithful to the facts as they, as they understood them. Are they alone? No. The International Rating Agency that lists all the countries in the world by degree of democracy, the first four categories from democracy in the top to uh, you know, dictatorship on the bottom, four different categories of government. The US for many years was in the top category, democratic. It has officially slipped out of that category <laughs> as of, I think it was six or eight years ago. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly when uh, we, we lost our status of that kind. That is the evidence who are interested in evidence, the evidence uh, uh, increasingly is that we live in a democracy. It means that we, like the Ukrainians, like any people, uh, peoples around the earth, have had to figure out how can we overthrow whatever you want to call it, through the oligarchy, overthrow the dictatorship, overthrow whatever you want to call it. Um, and we have to figure that out. So what I did was wrote a book about how we could do that stage by stage. And uh, it's a five stage framework, a strategic framework and to, uh, to look at it. It's in paperback. And George, the name of that book, that particular book again? Maybe it's now called, it keeps changing its title uh, because when it goes from hardcover to paperback and so on. So I think the latest title is Toward, yes, Toward a Living Revolution. Toward a Living Revolution. You can search by author, that makes it easy. But Toward a Living Revolution, because the concept that I wanted to build into the title that was real to me was Living Revolution. That is a revolution that's on the side of life, including an ecological view of what, of what life is about, a big picture ecological view that includes other species and so on. Um, and, and so that's, that's built into that framework. 
I'm aware of the time and I'm aware that uh, we are obviously, and by, by the number and the, the scope, ask very good questions in the chat. Um, this conversation about finding another way, another way that you know honors life more than we our present ways of doing things, uh, can go in different all directions, many different directions. Uh, and uh, it was just uh, unfortunately only a, a sample of <laughs> of this issue uh, in this one hour program. Um, so I think we're about at the stage of going into. Uh, five minutes of silent worship. But before I do that, uh, George or Mary, did you have any wish to add? I guess the one thing I'll say is that if anyone wants to try to find transcripts and recordings, I, I George's email is in the chat. I'll put that in there one more time. You can go to the Santa Monica website. You could also go to the Western Friend website and we have a, a newsletter that comes out once a week called Extra Extra Western Friend. So if you find Extra Extra Western Friend on the Western Friend website, there will be a page that I'll put out next Saturday that will consolidate as much of the notes and chat comments and everything as I can uh, from today. And it's, it's really wonderful, all the heart that people have poured into the chat. And I'm sorry that we didn't have enough time to actually let people to ask their questions live because I'm, I'm sure a lot of people had a lot that they wanted to say and ask. Well, I, I live. You're live. Yes. Uh, well, I hope that this will be an encouragement for friends to, uh, and everyone watching, to go to the Nonviolence website and uh, read the Nonviolence articles, because I've published over 100 there that have dealt with how to respond to fascists, if they're fascists in your neighborhood, and uh, just all kinds of questions of personal safety. Uh, how do we main, you know, give ourselves a good chance for personal safety, even if there's an assailant out there uh, who's wanting to get us? And uh, I've, I've just dealt with a whole lot of the different questions that come up with regard to violence, conflict, and economic oppression, and environmental oppression in the columns. But I'm not alone by any means. Waging on Violence has a lot of fascinating uh, writers who tend to harvest their stuff. By uh, by publishing and waging nonviolence. Well, thank you, George, very much. And with that, uh, we'll we'll enter into a a period of closing silence and violence, and we'll we'll at that point.
Thank you for all your years of teaching, George. Thank you, Santa Monica Meeting, for instigating this time together. And thank you, uh, everyone, for your love for our life on this world. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you again, George. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Bless you, George. And my friend Rolling Adams is here, who's just out of Kern Valley State Prison for a couple days, and this is his first Zoom. Whoa. Hi, Ollie. Pleased to see you. <coughs> Dad, wonderful to, to know you were here. I know. <laughs> 